Okay, Acts chapter 25 this morning. And um, I love to live in a world of technology. I mean, isn't it amazing, the technology that we have available to us today? I, I love it and I hate it at the same time. Um, because you can, like, take your phone and take a selfie of yourself. That's creepy. But it's going on Facebook. That's going on Facebook. I'm going to share it with the entire world. Um, I can sit in the doctor's office while they're getting ready to examine my head, and I can book airline tickets. Or my wife could be in shopping, and I could be out in the car shopping, right? I mean, it's just crazy. Or I could play a game, or I could... Um, it's just about, I mean, endless, I, I mean, things you can do with, with, with phones today, with technology, with iPads, all those things. I mean, we just have the world at our fingertips until we don't. And the battery dies, 0% charged, and it goes, and all of a sudden, you are immortal again. <laughs> you don't have omniscience anymore. You, know, you can't say... Google, okay, Google, you know, and just, you know, it tells you anything you want to know. It's pretty amazing. But, um, you know, you think about that. I mean, how many of you guys have become dependent on technology to the point that you're on your way to the bathroom and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I forgot my phone. And you go back. <laughs> Guilty, right? I mean, that's, that's the world we live in. And, and it's so sad to us when that just, when that technology dies and we have no battery in our phone and we're just kind of stuck being normal again. And, and <clears throat> I think, you know, in a sense, you know, the, the, um, the freedom, the, the amazing ability, all that, um, probably similar to what Paul felt as he was, you know, just free to share the gospel, go everywhere he wanted to go, um, talk to people about Jesus, and, and then, of course, just suddenly imprisoned, put in prison and, and stuck in prison with zero charge, and that's what this is all about, zero charge against him. There was nothing against Paul that should have held him there, but for whatever frustrating reason, he's been sitting there for two whole years just waiting for something to change, just waiting for a, a release so that he can get back into the world, so he can get to Rome like Jesus promised him he was going to be. Now, just to set the scene as to where we're at in Acts chapter 25, just to kind of catch you up if you haven't been here, or just to remind you if you have, basically Paul had gone down to Jerusalem to bring an offering to the church there. When he got there, they were excited about what God was doing, but they said, hey, when we're in Jews in Jerusalem, we act more like Jews than we act like Christians. So just be warned. That's kind of how we are here. And so, you know, take this vow. So he did. He kind of went along, played along with them, um, shaved his head, took the vow, paid for other guys to take the vow. But while he was in the temple... Um, of course, the Jews from Asia got very upset when they saw him. They'd seen him earlier in the city with Trophimus. They thought that he had brought Trophimus into the temple. And so they freaked out. And they said, this guy, this is the guy who, who basically spreads poison throughout the entire world, speaks against these people, against Ju Moses, against the temple. And he brought a Gentile into the temple, you know, a non-Jew. And so they grabbed him. They pulled him out of the temple. They began to beat him. They were intending on killing him. And, and then, of course, the commander, Claudius Lysias, comes down, rescues Paul, takes him up on the steps. Paul addresses the people. They were listening until he said Gentile again. And then they all freaked out. And so Claudius Lysias takes him in. And the next morning, takes him before the Sanhedrin. And he's talking to them. And he's like, you know, this is going to be a great opportunity. And he says, I've lived in good conscience until this day. And then they punch him in the mouth. You know, and, and then it just got worse from there. He says, you know, I'm just on trial for the resurrection. And they start arguing amongst themselves. And Claudius Lysias, the commander, comes and grabs him again and rescues him one more time. And Paul is kind of in prison, in jail, wondering what's going to happen. Is this where I die? Is this where it's over? You know, game over for Paul. But then, remember, and that's when Jesus stood with him. That's when Jesus was there. And Jesus said, Paul, don't, he says, be of good cheer. Don't be afraid, Paul. Be of good cheer. Now you've testified of me in Jerusalem, so also you will testify of me in Rome. And so Paul is excited about going to Rome. Jesus has told him, I'm going to Rome. Now, it didn't stay good for very long because he found out the next day that there was a plot against his life. And so Claudius Lysias grabbed Paul with 470 soldiers and sent him up to Jerusalem to protect him against this plot of the Jews where they were bound themselves by an oath to not eat anything for, you know, until, they, Paul, until Paul was dead. And so Paul goes up to Caesarea, takes him with 470 soldiers up to Caesarea to be judged there by Felix, who was the procurator or the governor of the area. 
and he stands before Felix, and the people come up to, to um, accuse Paul, and, and they didn't accuse him of anything substantial. And so Felix, you know, should have just let him go. Should have just said, hey, he's not guilty of anything. I'm just going to let him go. But because Felix was greedy and he wanted Paul to bribe him, he didn't let him go. Now remember, Paul did talk to Felix. He brought his wife Drusilla with him to see Paul. And um, as Claudius, or excuse me, as Felix and and uh, Drusilla were standing before Paul, he talked to them about righteousness, about self-control, and about ju- the judgment to come. And they got very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable, seeing that Felix had stole Drusilla from another man. You know, just kind of a weird deal. And of course, that's when uh, Felix says, "Hey, you know, Paul, why don't you go away for now, and I'll call you back at a more convenient time." You know. Well, Paul kind of languishes in this jail for two years until Felix is out of office. And we see that here in verse 27 of chapter 24. If you look just at one verse back, it says, But after two years, Pontius or Suporcius Festus um, succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. And so we, we exchange um, Felix the cat for Porcius the pig. <clears throat> just kidding. I, I, I couldn't resist it. Um, but history tells us that Felix had been brutal with the people of Judea. And of course, um, the Syrians and the, and the Judeans got in kind of a skirmish. And Festi- excuse me, Felix took the opportunity in this skirmish to go and plunder the Jewish people. And because of that, Rome found out. They complained to Rome. Rome brought charges against him. He was brought before Nero. And they were going to have him executed, but his brother Paulus, who was a friend of Nero, came and rescued him. And basically, the charges were lowered to losing his governorship, his procuratorship, and being exiled. And tradition tells us, and and when I say that, I'm just going to give you guys a little bit of clue into what these words mean. Tradition. Um, Tradition means that this is probably what happened, but there's a few other accounts out there that other people wrote about that say something different. Okay, so when we say tradition, we say it's, it could have happened this way, but there's other people who, who differ. Okay, that's what it means. But tradition tells us that Felix, um, being shamed by this whole thing, killed himself. And that wasn't an, that wasn't uncommon for um, people who were exiled or people who had um, been shamed in their governmental role to to commit suicide. And of course, Drusilla, his wife, um, would find herself with Felix's son um, in. Pompeii in 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius erupted and they were killed there along with the other um, Pliny the Younger was the other um, prominent figure that we know of that was killed in that eruption as well and so Drusilla Felix losing his life taking it by his own hand not heeding the things that Paul had told him about salvation and Drusilla it's hard to say you know maybe she did get saved I hope she got saved before she was covered in lava, you know? I mean, it's one of those things. But, um, you know, being one of the most beautiful women in, in the world, um, according to Josephus, the most beautiful woman in Judea for sure, um, and yet it's such a tragic end. But that brings us to verse 1 where Porcius Festus takes over. It says, Now when Festus had come to the province, after three days he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem. So Caesarea of course, being the capital of the region of the Roman. It's a Roman colony city, meaning it was it was really, in, I mean, I say this, it sounds funny, but a Rome away from Rome. And Rome, a Roman colony city was actually built to look like Rome, to feel like Rome. It had all the luxuries of Rome, meaning lighted, lit, lit street, main roads were lit at night. Um, there was running water, there was plumbing, um, toilets. You know, a lot of those luxuries that were not available in a typical Judean town. You know, and, and so then they had aqueducts and things like that. Very, very advanced, probably more advanced than we would think, you know, in those days. Um, concrete that they poured under water. You know, they had this special concrete, you know, Romans invented concrete. And they would pour, pour the concrete under water and they built, pal- they built palaces out onto the water. And that's where Herod's palace was, out onto the water where Paul was staying. Um, built with three sides surrounded by the Mediterranean Sea. And so just a very, very advanced um, city that was the capital of that region. Now, you have to understand how this worked governmentally, because I think we get confused. Um, We have, you know, kings and governors and who's in charge of who and what. And how it worked was these kingdoms, Judea, Cilicia, 
the Decapolis, um, Syria, all of these places were local, had local governments, meaning that they had a king who was in charge of those regions. And over that king in those local regions was the Roman government. And of course, the governor or the pilot or the, the procurator sat over all of those kingdoms. And they were vassals, meaning they, they paid tribute or were underneath the, the superior Roman government. So just because somebody has the title of king does not mean that they're superior to the governor. The Roman government was all, um, was all prominent. And of course, um, in this, uh, you know, Caesarea, we, we see Festus coming to power. And, and Festus was, was holding the same office um, that Pontius Pilate held. Now, you remember Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was the one who had Jesus crucified. You remember that. A very, very well-known biblically, but not so well-known historically. And that's been a huge problem for Christians. I mean, throughout the centuries, it's been a big problem for Christians because, you know, who is this Pontius Pilate? Was he a real character? Somehow he's mysteriously absent from all Roman documents. I mean, we know all about Festus. We know all about Felix. We know all about these guys. Even Drusilla is well written of. But somehow Pontius Pilate is not. Why? There might be a few scattered things, but they're questionable even. And so for years, the critics have said Pontius Pilate was not even a real person. The Christians made it up. No government, no Roman governor, uh, governor killed Jesus Christ. It's just a big, fictitious, made-up thing by Christian people. And so that was pretty troubling for the church and difficult for many years until the early 90s. And in the early 90s, a guy was flying over Caesarea in a helicopter, ancient Caesarea, and because of the conditions, the Aswan Dam, the silt deposits, and the low um, water table that year, they saw this big horseshoe shape out in the bay. And they were like, what is that? And um, so they also saw Pontius Pilate waving. Just kidding, no. Um, so they go down there, they start to excavate, and what they found was the amphitheater of Caesarea. It was basically on the beach, covered up in sand, and they were able to excavate the whole thing and, and guess what they found in the amphitheater? It was commissioned by Pontius Politus. Right there on a plaque on the thing. Basically, it was built by Governor Pontius Pilate. And, and the reason that his name does not appear in Roman documents is because he upset Caesar and Caesar had him executed and basically, or exiled, or so, I can't remember exactly what his fate was, but basically stricken from the records. I don't want any record of this man who, to have ever existed. And so Pont, or Caesar had removed Pontius Pilate from the records of the Roman documents. And so that's why it's difficult to find anything about him. But we found it. And so now Christianity is exonerated once again. And this happens again and again and again. You don't realize how many, just in the last hundred years, how many discoveries have confirmed the things that the Bible has said. I mean, it's amazing as you just go through it. And, and see, this is, this is why it's so important that we realize that when we look at the Bible, it's really set apart from other books that claim scriptural authority. And there's a lot of books out there. Um, you know, every religion in the world has books that they consider to be scripture, except for a couple. I can, actually, I can think of a couple that don't. But most have books that they consider scripture. And yet, when you look at the claims that the books make, you know, about reality, about science, about all those things, they, they all fall short. Archaeology, you know, where is the archaeology that's written about in this book, supposedly from ancient Americas or whatever? And there's nothing there. You don't find it. And yet when you look at the Bible, the archaeologist Spade has found so many biblical sites that it is, it's unparalleled. In fact, William F. Albright, who was the leading archaeologist of our time in Middle East archaeology said that there has never been a biblical or excuse me there's never been an archaeological discovery that has contradicted or controverted a biblical reference and that's a pretty bold statement speaking of old testament and new testament a pretty bold statement by a a guy who's not even a christian and yet an archaeologist um we can we can trust the bible that we have and so now um the new peer curator there in Caesarea, Porcius Festus, we find him, um, he, he comes into power 
And Porcius Festus was not like Felix. Felix was known from history as kind of a scoundrel, right? We talked about that last time. He was, he was known as just an evil guy. But not Festus. Felix was an evil guy. Did I say? Yeah. Anyway, Felix was an evil guy, history tells us. But Festus was actually a, a really good and benevolent ruler over this area. And so he was very concerned about the Jews, about keeping peace, about fairness. And he worked very hard um, to keep peace. And so history has good things to say about him. And it, it was to his advantage to keep peace. You know, anytime um, somebody enters an office, he doesn't want to waste his time. Um, you know, he wants to deal with the things that are problems. And because Felix had left such a problem in Judea and the Jude- Judean people were upset with the Roman government, he had to come in and appease them or figure it out. You know, had to figure out a solution so that there would be peace. Because if, if there was a war or a revolt under his authority, the Pax Romana would kick in. And what the Pax Romana was, was the peace of Rome. And what that meant, that is if you cross Rome, we will bring all the power of the Roman army upon your little place and completely decimate it. And so, um, he, he had a very strong motive to keep peace there in Judea. Now, we also know that this happened. You know, we're not just guessing about the, the Roman armies coming upon a place and decimating it. We, we know it happened in 70 AD to Jerusalem when Titus Vespasian came in with his armies and basically made Jerusalem as flat as a pancake. The, Josephus records that it basically it was like looking at a, a, a freshly laid carpet as he, as you looked at the at the Judean landscape, it was like freshly laid carpet of dead bodies of the Jews. He he completely wiped everything out because the Jews were seen as a threat to the peace of Rome, and so and he actually did that, fulfilling a very interesting prophecy when Jesus said in Matthew chapter twenty four, and he mourned over the city. Remember, he weeping over the city even at one point. Um, if you know you're going to be laid desolate. But in Matthew chapter 24, he told his disciples that not one stone of this temple will be left upon another. As they were bragging about the magnificence of the building, he says, not one stone will be left upon another. And what happened was Titus, as he came into Jerusalem, his, his instructions were, do not destroy the temple. It was, a, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. I mean, you don't destroy a wonder of the world, right? Kill the people, keep the architecture, right? I mean... But it was a very, very valuable and very, very beautiful building. He didn't want it destroyed. But these Idumeans who had come down to help the Jews ran into the temple trying to hide from the slaughter. And as they were inside the temple, a Roman soldier took a torch and threw it up into a high window. And it went in there and it burned down. It burned the veil and it burned all the wood inside the temple, all the the curtains inside the temple, and it melted the, the, the menorah, which is six feet by six feet, solid gold, melted and went down into the cracks. And the, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, all these things melted, and, and all the gold went down in the cracks. And so Vespasian said, you know, take them down, take down. And they threw all the rocks over the, you can still see them today, they're laying there in Jerusalem off the Temple Mount. The, take the stones, throw them over the edge and get the gold. And so, I mean, the gold is very valuable. So, um, Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled that not stone will be, one stone will be left upon another. You know, just another key to um, what we have here in the Bible is, is just so um, accurate. Historically, prophetically, um, we can trust it. We have a very, very powerful and amazing book here in the Bible. So, um, Porcius Festus, um, he wanted to make peace and he didn't want to cause problems as he's getting in. So he doesn't waste any time getting to Jerusalem from um, Caesarea. He's there for three days. He's like, I got to get to Jerusalem. He gets to Jerusalem. I want to deal with this problem. Verse two, then the high priest, and the chief men of the Jews informed him against Paul and they petitioned him asking a favor against him that he would summon him to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. Now, I read this again and again and again and in different versions, and it's really unclear as to whether or not they said, hey, bring him down here so we can ambush him, or whether they said bring him down here and then they just plan to ambush him without telling him that. You, it's unclear, because later on it actually seems like they, they told him they were going to ambush him. But you have to remember that two years earlier, they tried the same plan 
of 40 guys who bound themselves by an oath that they wouldn't eat anything until Paul had been killed. And these guys were getting really, really hungry. So they had to do something. Verse 4 says, But Festus answered that Paul should be kept in Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, Let those who have authority among you go down with me and accuse this man to see if there is any fault in him. Now, we don't know how much Festus knew about Paul's case. It kind of indicates later that he didn't really know a whole lot about it. He was very green. Now, as Felix, remember I said Felix didn't fall off the beat truck yesterday? Um, He really understood the culture. He understood Christians. He understood Jews. He understood the dynamic of, of all the tensions there. But Festus did not. And so Festus did just fall off the beat truck. And he's given this problem and he comes down. It's unclear as if he knew Paul was one of his prisoners or not. But um, they ask him to bring him down. And um, it says, verse 4, but but Festus... Oh, I already read that. Um, So Festus um, basically says, I'm I'm not going to just give him over to you. You guys, why don't you guys just come up to anybody who has an accusation to bring, come up to Caesarea and or or down to Caesarea. It's it's north. It's hard for me because it's north, but everything was down from Jerusalem. And that could be because of elevation or it could be because Jerusalem's more important. I don't know. But everything was down from Jerusalem. So he says, you come down to Caesarea (coughs) and we'll sort it out. And um, it's interesting here because there is a law that you couldn't just hand, hand a Roman citizen over to somebody, for one. And the other thing is, is you couldn't change the venue that a, a Roman citizen would be tried at without his permission. The Roman citizen had a right to choose the venue uh, or to not be moved to a new venue. And so um, he understood this. Now, it would have been easy, um, really, you could kind of like an election year. You know, he's just been appointed. It's his job to keep peace. It might have been a goodwill thing for him just to kind of overlook this rule, but he seems to be wanting to work by the rules. And so you have the devil trying to work and then divine protection for Paul at the same time. Verse 6, it says, And when he had remained among them more than ten days, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, he commanded that Paul be brought. And when he had come, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood about and laid many serious complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. Now, it doesn't tell us um, what charges they were bringing against Paul, but by Paul's defense, you can kind of tell that it was very similar to the charges they'd brought before. I haven't done anything against Caesar. They're, they're blaming him for sedition, basically rebe- rebelling against the Roman government. Um, I haven't done anything against the temple. I didn't bring a Jew or a Gentile into the temple, which they had blamed him for as well. And I haven't broken Jewish laws. And so he's basically denying all the charges. And, and nothing would stick to Paul. Um, and yet there he sat. No charges against him. And he's just sitting there. And he's getting frustrated. And this is the problem. Verse 9. But Festus wanting to do the Jews a favor. Why is it that everybody wants to do the Jews a favor? Nobody wants to do Paul a favor. Everybody's wanting to do the Jews a favor, but Paul is kind of just left hanging to dry. Wanted to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? And so, like I said, he needed his permission to get get that change of venue. Now, if you think about it from a political standpoint, it's very complicated. If he just lets Paul go, he knows that the Jews are going to be very upset with him. He just lets him out, which would have been the right thing to do. But he doesn't want to upset an entire people group. But if he hands them over to the Jews, then the Roman citizens who know that Paul is a Roman citizen will cry foul because they're Roman citizens and they see somebody's rights being violated. They don't want their rights being violated. And also, if it's found out by Rome, then he would be in big trouble. And so he's in a very, very um, difficult place. Um, so he's looking for some sort of compromise, but Paul, by now, he's been waiting in jail for two years, unaccused, uncharged, and he's tired of the dog and pony show that these guys have been putting on for so long. And so it it says, um, verse 10, so Paul said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. 
to the Jews I have done no wrong, as you well know. In other words, I don't want to go to Jerusalem. I should be judged in Caesar's judgment seat. For I am, for if I am an offender or have committed anything deserving death, I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. Now, Paul, by doing this, just gave himself a ticket to Rome. He knew that by saying this, that they would stop the proceedings and send him directly to Rome from here on out. And so Paul is fulfilling what Jesus said. You testified me of Jerusalem, and now you're going to testify of me in Rome. Now that's kind of difficult for us as Christians, isn't it? Because how many of you as Christians want to make it happen? Isn't that the difficulty that we have? We want God's will. And so to make a decision that's going to guarantee that I'm going to move in the direction that I thought God might want to be taking me, is that God or is that me making it happen? You guys ever felt that way? In fact, I have people in my office all the time, and they want to know, Pastor Mike, I want to know God's will about this. You know, and, and sometimes it's pretty easy. I say, oh, is, is, you know, is, it, is God mad at me for this, or is this the wrong thing to do, or whatever? And I can just open up the Bible and say, well, this is what it says, and yeah, that ain't good, right? This, that's not the lifestyle you want to be living, or that's not the thing you want to do. Or no, God isn't telling you, you know, you can just take a little bit from work, right, on the side. He's not saying that, because it's very obvious in the Bible that, you know, if, if it contradicts what the Bible says, you know, it's not God's will. On the other hand, sometimes it's just something, you know, do I choose this job or do I choose that job? Do I move or do I stay? And then there's this huge question in your mind, and, and you know, what do I do about this situation? And, and sometimes a, a solution provides if I just do this one thing, that will set the wheels in that motion. And so I always ask them a question, and usually that's why they're in my office. So the question becomes very appropriate, and I say, do you have a peace about it? Because the, the Apostle Paul tells us to let the peace of God guide your life. And so when it comes to God's will for your life, not only should it agree with Scripture, or there shouldn't be anything against what you're deciding in Scripture, and not only should the doors be opening, but also you should have a peace about the decision. You know, and, and I think that if you don't have a peace about it, then you need to wait and pray longer. You know, and oftentimes that's why people want to talk to me. I'll ask them, do you have a peace about it? And they'll be like, well, you know, not really. Okay, well, don't do anything against your peace. And oftentimes that's where we find ourselves in trouble is when we see opportunity, but we have a check in our spirit about it, but we move forward recklessly. Hudson Taylor kind of came to, um, in, in his early life, he kind of had this struggle because he, he would do things, put himself in a specific situation so that he had to trust God. And he kind of became used to that and kind of also maybe became a little bit proud of that. And so when he got an opportunity to go to London to go to school, the school said, we'll pay for your expenses. But then his father said, also, I'll pay for your expenses while you're in London. And so what he decided was, I'm not going to take either. I'm not going to take the school's money. I'm not going to take my father's money. I'm just going to trust the Lord. And in doing so, the school thought his father was paying his expenses. His father thought the school was paying for his expenses. And so he was kind of incognito in there, feeling like he was just going to trust the Lord. And as he went forward, um, he was helping with a surgery at one point, and, or it was a, maybe it was a cadaver, but he, the guy had died from something bad, and he cut himself with the scalpel that they'd been cutting the cadaver with. And he started to feel sick, and the, actually the guy standing next to him says, you are a dead man. <laughs> Pretty scary. And he started to feel sick almost immediately. His blood became toxic. He only had enough money to get partway home on the bus because he didn't have any money. And he had to walk the rest of the way kind of delirious and collapsed and everything and ended up in the hospital. And his dad came and he's like, why in the world would you live in such squalor and not take my, opportunity, my, my money that I offered you? I thought, you know, what are you doing? And he realized later, and he talked about this later in his life, he says, sometimes when God opens up an opportunity for somebody to provide for you, you have to be humble enough to accept that. You know, and sometimes that's the, oper the way God's going to do it, and some way, sometimes it's not. But really, it comes down to your relationship with God. And speaking to God and saying, God, is this what you want, or is that what you want? And if I have a peace about it, and, and the offer is there, 
Maybe that's the way that God wants to work it out. And we have to, we have to, you know, not try to overthink things. And so Paul, obviously, feeling the prompt from the Lord that this is time to go to Rome and this is how I want to send you to Rome. Now I guarantee you, Paul would have rather gone to Rome as a free man than as a prisoner. But maybe it took him two years in prison to realize this is what Jesus wants to do. Now on a side note, I have to ask the question, would we even have the book of Acts if Paul wouldn't have gone to Rome as a prisoner? Oh, why would I even say that? Well, because Luke, it seems, was writing to most excellent Theophilus about the, all the things that had happened in Jesus' life, the book of Luke, and all the things that had happened in the apostles' life, the book of Acts. The things that Jesus continued to do through his church. And, and as we look at these books, it almost seems as though, and because he's writing to a government official, most excellent Theophilus, that would be a title of somebody in high authority, that he is giving an account of Christianity, kind of a, a history from the beginning to the end, to show that Paul is not an insurrectionist, and to show that he um, has done nothing deserving death, and that, he, that Luke actually wrote the book of Acts as, a, as basically a, um, a defense for Paul in his case against Rome. And yet, the Holy Spirit would, would prompt that or, or um, engineer that so that we would have the book of Luke and have the book of Acts, which are invaluable to us as a church today, right? And so God always has His reasons. Everything is for a reason. But Paul knows he's not going to be safe on trial in Jerusalem because of their previous threats of ambush. And so he says something that is notable. I've done nothing worthy of death, and yet if, I've, if there is anything I've done, then I'm not opposed to dying. I'm not opposed to being killed. And so um, doesn't object to dying, but he knows that he hasn't done anything. And so he asks to be... Um, taken before Caesar, and that was Paul's right as a Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar. Um, and he'll be in, a prisoner until Christianity becomes a crime, actually. And Caesar, Nero, will eventually kill Paul, and Paul will be a prisoner. And, and you know, and, and why? You know, why would Paul be a prisoner all those years? Again, you think of the prison epistles that Paul has written, and how valuable they are to the church, and how we probably wouldn't have those if Paul could visit them. You read that. I, I long to come see you. You know, I long to write to you. You know, to, so I, I wish I could see you instead of writing to you, but we're glad that he wrote, right? Verse 12. And then Festus, when he conferred with, his, with the council, answered, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. And so he checks with his advisors. Is, this, is there any reason why he can't go to Caesar? They say, no, he's appealed to Caesar. He goes to Caesar, and so he just yields. He's probably thinking, you know, good, not my problem anymore. And then he realizes, wait a minute, so what am I going to tell Caesar why I'm sending him? Verse 13, after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. No, so now we have a new, um, a new uh, guy on the scene, King Agrippa. Now, okay, king, how, how is he a king, right? King over Judea, a vassal kingdom, right? They're a, a subservient kingdom to Rome. And so Agrippa was over Judea, as was his father and his father's father, um, Herod the Great and Herod Agrippa I. And now he's Herod Agrippa over this kingdom of Judea, but under the procurator, who was the governor of all of that region. Right, and so that's who. That's how we have. You know, the, you always wonder about the kings. You know, how is there King Herod or is it Caesar? You know, I was always confused about that when I was a kid. That's how it worked. So King Agrippa comes up, King Herod Agrippa the second, son of Herod Agrippa the first, who killed James, who beheaded John the Baptist, who um, stood at, the, at trial with Jesus. This is the his his dad, savory character, just a neat guy, right? Um, who also stood before. Um, the the people of Tyre and Sidon in the amphitheater at Caesarea, the one that Pontius Pilate built, and proclaimed, um, you know, a, an oration to the people of Tyre and Sidon wearing a silver thread gown. And as the light shined on him, they began to chant the voice of a God and not of a man. And he received their worship and an angel struck him and he fell down dead, eaten of worms. Two days later, his bowels gushed open with worms. Disgusting. Um, so this guy died 
And this was the father of King Agrippa II, this guy. Now, if you're putting the pieces together, you'll realize also this is Drusilla, Felix's wife's brother. Okay? All the pieces falling into place. This is her brother. And Bernice is his wife, uh, his sister. Okay, now that's as weird as it sounds because there was something going on there and um, history tells us that there was definitely something not quite right. Well, Drusilla, or excuse me, Bernice, Julius Bernice, Julia Bernice, had been married twice before um, to a king named Marcus Alexander and then he died and she was married to her uncle, Herod of um, Calcius, and he was also a vassal king. And, um, and he died and then she just moved in with her brother and was with him for several years. Now, Herod Agrippa um, probably wouldn't have been suspected of incest with his sister Bernice, except he never married. And so that was, it was just kind of became bizarre, their relationship. She shared equal rule with him while she was with him as the queen. And um, Josephus said there was definitely an incestuous relationship, but to, to dispel the rumor, she married Polemon II of Pontius, and she's only married to him for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and maybe, and divorced him, um, and then went back to her brother. And so things were definitely weird between them. Um, but then later she would marry Tacitus and leave him for his son Vespasian, who would put her away because of her bad reputation of, you know, discarding men. Um, there was a there was actually a support group for um, post traumatic Bernice disorder in Rome, but she was just one of those ladies. Um, who makes our story interesting. But a beautiful woman, but not as beautiful as her sister, Ducilla. And she kind of lived in the shadow of that her entire life. And Roman history tells us that she was always jealous of Drusilla. Um, verse 14, it says, When they had been there many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, There's a certain man left a prisoner by Felix who, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem asking for a judgment against him. To them I answered, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets, his, meets the accused, accusers face to face and has an opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charges against him. Now you remember he said to Felix, um, you know, I wish that the people, the, the, Roman, the Jews from... Ephesus were here. They're the ones, the Jews from Asia were the ones who accused me. Too bad they're not here to tell me, you know, to, to, uh, to say what, you know, they need to say. And of course, that was the same thing. There was never anybody who actually saw Paul bring a Gentile into, or claimed him bringing a Gentile into the temple to actually accuse him of that. Verse 17, therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accuser stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things, I suppose. So he kind of had an idea, oh, I know what this is going to be about. And it turned out to be completely different. But had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus whom had died, whom Paul said, or who Paul affirmed to be alive. And so he's completely confused. Like I said, he has no, he has no idea about the culture of the Jewish people, the religion of the Jewish people, or Christianity. And so he's like, you know, they're complaining about he's breaking their religious rules. He's saying that this Jesus guy who died, he's saying he isn't dead, he's alive. What is going on? I have no idea what is happening here. Um, just thinking about this, just a, a side note, I just, wanted to, um, I just want to make a comment. I think that it's important that when we're talking to somebody about the gospel, sharing the gospel with somebody, that we kind of get an idea as to where they're coming from. And oftentimes, like, like Festus here, we can completely miss the people that we're talking to, you know, when we're telling them about Jesus. And um, just a, a good example, yesterday, um, Aaron Grandine was sharing with us how he came out of a cult and um, got saved and, and, you know, just how, um, how confused he was about a lot of things. And, you know, just it was very frustrating for him coming out of that, all that mindset of, you can't ever go to the doctor and Jesus isn't God and just things that he had been taught. And little by little, he was able to kind of break free from that. But because of that experience, he's very careful when he talks to people to ask a lot of questions about what they believe and kind of get a, a baseline as to where they're coming from. Where, where are these people coming from so that he can effectively share the gospel with them? And I think that that's important, you know, because sometimes people just don't know anything when it comes to biblical stuff. And we can come in with a bunch of Christianese and they can be completely lost 
and, and have completely different ideas about what we said than what we meant. Um, for instance, one guy came to church one time, and I'd gone through my entire sermon, and afterwards he came up and he's like, I really liked your speech, um, but I'm not quite sure who that, I've never met John, the guy you're talking about, and Paul, I, I'm, I'm not really sure who those guys are, but I really liked your speech, you know? <laughs> And so, like, he, he thought that, like, Paul and John, you know, and I always say, like, you remember John said this, or, and he's, like, you know, thinking that those were people that went to our church or something. <laughs> but, you know, people just, sometimes they're just completely a blank slate when it comes to that, and we have to be careful that we're not missing people. You know, if they have a religious belief, a religious system, to, to kind of maybe study that a little bit and kind of understand where they're coming from, um, just so that we can talk to them more effectively. So anyway, Felix, or Festus rather, is, is completely lost. Verse 20, and because I was certain of such questions, uh, uncertain of such questions, he says, I didn't know what was going on. I asked whether he was willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning the, these matters. In other words, maybe somebody down there could understand better than I could. But when Paul appealed to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, okay, so this is uh, another title of Caesar, um, Caesar Nero, and all Caesars would take the title of Augustus, meaning the august one, or the one who stands before the gods. That was kind of the idea of um, the word Augustus, or the name Augustus. He, when he reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could till I send him to Caesar. So he feels a grip in on the drama and his confusion. Is, it's obvious. Verse 22. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So the next day, when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium with the commanders and with the prominent men of the city at, and at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men who are present here present with us, you see this man about whom the whole assembly of the Jews petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, crying out that he was not fit to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing deserving of death and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I decided to send him and having nothing certain to write to my Lord concerning him, therefore I have brought him out before you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the examination has taken place, I may have something to write. For it seemed to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not to specify the charges against him. So 0% charged. He has nothing against him, and he's saying, hey, I just brought you guys out, especially you, King Agrippa, because he was the king over Judea, and he understood all the vibe that was happening there. He says, you can tell me what criminal offense I can put against this guy, because so far, nothing. He's completely innocent. And, and yet, Paul would even claim that. He says, I live in good conscience before God until this day. That's what he had said to the Jewish people. Also, he said, I, have, I, I strive to live in good conscience towards God and towards men. Okay, and so both those statements are pretty bold. And now they're saying he is innocent. Just as Pontius Pilate said about Jesus, he is an innocent man. He's not deserving punishment. He's not deserving death. And yet I wonder this morning how you feel about that. If you were to stand before judgment and someone were to say, you are guilty, how would you fare? What would be the charges against you? And I think all of us have that idea within our hearts at, at times, man, I am, I am guilty. I am wicked. I have sinned. And you think about the lies that you've told. You think about the people that you've wronged. Innocent people that you've hurt, the things that you've stolen, the things that you've lusted after. And, and as I just mentioned all these, you're probably kind of bringing to mind, oh yeah, that, that crime, that thing, that sin. And I ask you this morning, can you say, I am free in conscience. I am 0% charged when it comes to being guilty? Or does your conscience condemn you? 
Do you feel the weight of condemnation? Are you like me when I was 18 years old, when I just had this sense, this overwhelming sense, this voice in my head saying, you are going to go to hell for the things you are doing? And that guilt weighed on my heart. Maybe that's what even brought you to to church this morning. This overwhelming feeling of, I need an answer, I need to somehow undo the wrong that I've done. And yet, right now, you're just feeling like, man, I am so guilty. I am so in trouble. I have good news for you. I have good news for you in that Jesus Christ came into this world because of that guilt. And Jesus would die upon the cross to take upon your sin. The Bible tells us that God loved the world so much that He gave His only Son that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, Jesus took upon your sin, upon your guilt, upon your shame, upon your condemnation. He took that all upon Himself and then He was punished and He died on the cross in your place. He paid your debt. And then He rose from the grave conquering sin and death and offers to you, if you will believe in Me, if you believe that I did it all, Jesus would say, then you can be forgiven of your sin and you can be reconciled to the Father. Man, what an offer. He says exchange your life. That's what the word repentance means. It means to turn around, do a 180, go the opposite direction and say, I don't want... My sinful, awful, wrecked, ruined, guilty life. I want what Jesus has for me. And to turn to Jesus and to say, Jesus, I want what You have. I don't want to live life for myself anymore. I want to make You, Lord. I want to live life for You. And when we do that, we say we believe, Jesus. We believe in You. We believe that You died for my sins. The Bible tells us that we are born again. For, for be- believing makes us righteous And confession, to confess Jesus as Lord, to tell people Jesus is my Lord, we confess unto salvation. And the Bible says, whoever puts their trust in Him, whoever calls the name of the Lord, will not be put to shame. And if you have not ever done that, if you sit here guilty this morning, I invite you to come and and give your life to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus, I need You in my life. I need You to forgive me of my sin." because I am guilty before You. This is what the book of Romans says in Romans 8.33. It says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It means He makes you just. Who is, it he, who, is he who condemns? Who, who condemns you? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even sitting at the right hand of God and makes intercession for you. The one who would condemn you, the one who would call you guilty and say you deserve hell for all eternity is the one who paid the price for your sin. And if you call on Him, He will plead your case. And what what does He say when He pleads your case? I paid for His sin. I paid for Him. He's perfect before you, Father. He's covered by My blood. And you are justified before the Father. And you are received into His kingdom based on what Jesus did and what Jesus did alone. Not of works of righteousness that we have done, but by grace He has saved us. It is Jesus alone that saves us from our sin. And when we put our trust completely in Him and not in our good works, not in our efforts, but in Him alone, we pass from death to life. And if you haven't done that, I encourage you, don't leave here without doing that today. Pray with me right now to receive Him.